Good morning. I like that. <laughs> God's blessings to you. Have a very, uh, we have a great day today. This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Today's uh, service actually revolves around why Jesus is the only way. We live in a world today that tells us there are many different ways. Just as there are many different paths that you can go to get to certain places, there are many different ways to God. And yet, for 2,000 years, Christianity has taught that Jesus is the only way. And so today we're going to take a look at why that has to be that way. And that it's not an unloving thing to actually say, but it is the most loving thing that you can say to someone because then you can tell them the most fantastic good news that they have ever heard. And that's about what Jesus has done for them. We will rise to sing our opening hymn, which is In Thee is Gladness. come to our God this day in his holy name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear loved ones in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a few moments of silence to reflect upon uh, God's Word, as well as examining our own selves before God. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Loved ones in Christ, Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have called us to enter your kingdom through the narrow door. Guide us by your word and spirit and lead us now and always into the feast of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may follow him on the way that leads to eternal life. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> The Old Testament reading for this morning recorded for us in the very last chapter of uh, one of the longest books in the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, the 66th chapter. The Lord says, and I, because of what they have planned and done, am about to come and gather the people of all nations and languages, and they will come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them, and I will send some of those who survived to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans and Lydians, famous as archers, to Tubul and Greece, and to the distant islands that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will proclaim my glory among the nations, and they will bring all your people from the nations to my holy mountain in Jerusalem as an offering to the Lord on horses and chariots and wagons, and on mules and camels, says the Lord, they will bring them as the Israelites bring their grain offerings to the temple of the Lord in ceremonially clean vessels. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will select some of them also to be priests and Levites, says the Lord. As the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so will your name and descendants endure. From one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all mankind will come and bow down 
before me, says the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Our epistle leading for this day is recorded in the uh, letter of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to a, such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. This is the word of the Lord. And out of honor for our Lord Jesus Christ, we rise to hear the reading of the Holy Gospel. And this is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you have come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from the east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed. There are those who are last who will be first, and first who will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. At this time, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostolic Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We remain standing and say, God loved the world so that he gave.
be seated. Would you take a few moments with me in prayer? Gracious Father, may the words of my mouth and may the meditation of our hearts always be on you and what your word says. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My text is Luke 13, the gospel lesson for today, and we actually are going to talk about why Jesus, and particularly the promise that comes in Jesus Christ, happens to be the only way to God. That's not a popular thing today, because if you uh, uh, tell people that you believe that Jesus is the only way to God, uh, they'll say, are you arrogant? How can you be so arrogant? They'll say, how do you know something like that? They will... uh, They may ridicule you, and there are even people in many churches that will do the exact same thing to you. Now, why is it? Well, anybody here ever been to Japan? (laughs) Seen Mount Fuji? (laughs) Okay. I learned something about them, about that mountain. And that is, at the top of Mount Fuji happens to be a Buddhist shrine. And all the paths that start off at the bottom will lead everyone up to the top of the mountain where they can be at the Buddhist shrine. And this is how it is when it comes to how many people think. They'll say, yes, there are many religions in the world. Look at all these. And this is just a handful of them. Uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Taoism, Baha'i, Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism, Paganism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Shintoism, and we could go on and name many more, and people will say, well, after all, they all talk about God, and uh, they all lead to the same place. Isn't it true that a rose by any other name is still a rose? Well, let's look what Jesus has to say. In our gospel lesson for this today, he says this. Someone asked him, Lord... Are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. By the way, uh, you probably wonder, what in the world is that picture of? That's a narrow door (laughs) going into a house. (laughs) Yeah, can you imagine uh, trying to get through something like that? And uh, he says, enter by the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. He goes on and says, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. And then Jesus goes on and uh, the man says, uh, away from me all You evildoers, there will be weeping Uh, then. uh, There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth, and you will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are three of the Old Testament greats. And all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. Now, this is just one of the times that Jesus talks about uh, the narrowness of the way to God. Remember how he said the, the, the road is wide that leads to destruction? But it's a narrow one that takes you to life. Why is that? Is that arrogant to say? Well, you might even say, well, come on, Pastor Doug, there are... There are all these different religions in the world. Uh, if, there, if we have to say one of them is, quote, true, which one is? I mean, because uh, there's so many. Do I have to try them all before I kind of figure out which one works and which one is not workable? My answer is no, you don't have to try them all out uh, because I will narrow it down. There may be a lot of different types of religions out there but there are only two religions, actual religions in the entire world. Two doors. The first one is the gospel religion. The promise that I've been talking about over the last few weeks that only comes to you and me in Jesus Christ. 
that it's through what Jesus has done for us that our sins are totally forgiven and there is nothing that we do to get ourselves right with God because he has already made us and the world right with him by what Jesus has done. And he promises us life in Jesus and he simply invites us to believe that. Now, that's one. The other religion out there is the one that's always talking about you need to do this, you need to do that if you're going to have God get on your side. That's called law. Law promises if you do this way, if you pray this way, if you uh, obey this way. And all of these different religions, while they disagree on what you're supposed to be, quote, doing, they all agree that you need to be doing something in order to get yourself to God. And that's called law. And that's, that just narrows it down. you got two religions in the world. you got Jesus, which is gospel. you got everything else, which is law. Jesus himself says, I am the door. He's the door. He's not a philosophy. By the way, I, I want to also state this, and that is, people say, so Christianity is the only way. No, Jesus is the only way. There are all different types of Christianities. And, and uh, you know, uh, and there are even many different types of Christianities that will teach you that the, you, you got to be doing this or this or this in order to get Jesus to forgive you or whatever. Well, those are all law too. But the Jesus that comes from Christianity, the Jesus that we see in the Holy Scriptures, that's who I'm talking about. And he says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. That's why Peter, uh, in one of his messages, says this, there is salvation in no one else. That's mighty arrogant, isn't it? There's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Now, that today is called hate speech. (laughs) And people will tell you, that's a hateful thing to say. Is it? Is it really a hateful thing to say? I beg to differ with that. It is not hate speech. It's first truth speech. But even more than that, it is the greatest act of love speech that a person can can ever proclaim. And here's the reason why. Because it shares God's great act of love in dealing with the sin of all people in dealing with their alienation from God. What have I been preaching for the last month or so? I've been talking about how God loved the world so much that he, that he sent Jesus who took the sins of the world away. And he forgave the sins of all people. And now the message is, just come to him, believe that, trust that, hold on to that. That's fantastically good news. You know, we all know John 3, 16. We can probably quote it from heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should should not not perish but have everlasting life. But there's another section of that. The next verse afterwards, verse 17, where Jesus says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn or judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. But still people will say, okay, that's great, but still, why can't there be other ways to God? I mean, look at this. This is a highway system. I'd hate to be driving it. Uh, It'd be very confusing, but you've got all these different religions going all these different ways. And if you notice, down at the bottom left hand side, uh, it doesn't say Christianity first. It does say Christianity, but it puts it into parentheses. I did that for a purpose. 
because it's not about religion. It's about Jesus. It's just that this Jesus happens to be proclaimed by Christianity. It's all about Jesus. Now, but why? How in the world? I mean, can't other ways get us there? No. Why? Because they're all dead ends. It's only Jesus who is uh, who can get us there. Why? Because they're all religions of the law. They're all religions that say you got to do this, you got to do that if you want God to forgive you or God to love you or to God to get you into here. You got to be a certain way. They stress that so much. It's only Jesus who says, I have forgiven your sins 2,000 years ago at the cross. And in my resurrection from the dead, I have proved to you that, that this is true. You are forgiven. Please believe that. Paul brings this out when he says how religions of law do not save. He says, now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law. In order, here's why God gave the law, in order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. The law was given to show us our sin. I mean, the Ten Commandments were given many, 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 many centuries after Adam and Eve blew it. They were never given to, to save you at all. Paul says, for no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is to make us know that we have sinned. It points its finger and says, you blew it. And so in most other religions, what happened is you got people who were trying really hard, never knowing whether or not if they made it enough. And so I'm never sure that on the last day where they actually will stand before God and him allow them in. Not so when it comes to Jesus. And it all has to do with this. Blood. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Well, why? Because in the Old Testament, it says that the life is in the blood. When we talk about blood, we're talking about life. And there is no forgiveness without the giving of life. And that happens to be not our life, because if we gave our life, we would be end up uh, eternally separated from God. But it happens to come because of the life of Jesus. He sheds his blood. He gives his life for you and me. We have to know that old gospel story before we can get into any of all of this. Uh, we have to begin first in Genesis 2, where God, uh, where that very first rebellion of the human race uh, came into existence uh, that brought death into this world. Moses writes in Genesis 2, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And remember, the devil convinced both Adam and Eve that, oh, that's a lie from God. He, he just doesn't want you to, uh, uh, to, to enjoy the good things. And so what they do is they disobey God. And by the way, sin is not, the word sin doesn't mean anything anymore to people. But it means rebellion, basically. Treason against God saying, I really don't want you, God. I'll do my own thing. It's spitting on God and saying, I'll just do what I want. Forget what you have to say. Just bug off from me. Well, they did just that. And then they realized, uh-oh. The law comes to them and tells them, you blew it, and they go, uh-oh, we are in serious trouble. And so what do they do? They decide to figure out it on themselves. They, they come up with their own self-solution. 
We're told, that then the eyes of both of them were opened. They began to understand things. And they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I don't know about that one. Sewing fig leaves together would not exactly get you very far. It wouldn't take before, very far before you started walking around and all of a sudden you'd find out, oh gosh, they're gone. And we're told, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they try their own solution. We'll cover ourselves with, 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 with our own solutions and we'll hide. Well, that doesn't do any good. God finds them. He talks to them about their sin. And then he makes Of all things, the very first gospel promise. This is the first gospel promise in the entire Old Testament, and it's in Genesis 3.15. Pastor Mark talked about it a lot. lot. Pastor Jim talks about it a lot. I talk about it a lot. Why do we talk about it a lot? Because it's important. (laughs) Here you have God uh, talks first to the devil, and he says something very negative to him, and then he speaks to the woman, and he says something very positive to her. God says, and I, talking to the devil, and I will put hostility between you and the woman. You're not going to like her. She's not going to like you. And between her offspring and your offspring, those who uh, follow her are are not going to like you either. And by the way, those who follow you are not going to like the others either. He, singular, He, that's Jesus, he will strike your head, crush you, and you will strike his heel. You'll harm him. Now, it doesn't tell us a whole lot except for that. I mean, we don't know the name Jesus. We don't know about the crucifixion. We don't know anything about that. But we do know that, hey, God's going to undo the mess that Adam and Eve brought into this world, which you and I now have to exist with. He said, I'm going to do it by sending a deliverer. But that deliverer is going to ultimately have to pay the price for it. Just a few verses later, God does something amazing, I think. He tells them, those fig leaves are worthless. Here. The Lord God then made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. I think it's a fascinating thing that this is the first shedding of blood in the Bible. God is reminding Adam and Eve that the only way that he's going to be able to get them out of the predicament they're in is there's going to be shedding of blood, the giving of life. This is one of the first hints of the gospel promise and about the shedding of blood. And from then on out in the Old Testament, we see the shedding of blood constantly in sacrifices. Pastor Jim talked last week about Abraham. Uh, here's what we're told. Abraham was told by God to take his son and to sacrifice him. And God wasn't really going to do that with him, but he just was giving Abraham a little test there. And Abraham, he's out there getting ready to, to, uh, to strike, and God says, don't do it. I know now that you're going to believe my word and trust me. And then we're told, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I love his answer, Abraham's. Abraham answered, not I will supply it, but God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And then we're told Abraham looked up, And there, caught in a thicket, you can't see it too well with this picture, but off to the right, in the middle of the screen of this uh, uh, painting, uh, is a ram caught in a thicket. He saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead 
of his son. And from then on out, you're going to see all throughout the Old Testament sacrifices. You're going to have the Jews sacrificing in the, uh, uh, in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And when they get to Jerusalem, they're going to sacrifice in the temple where it is all about the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins. And then one day a year, the big day is going to come called Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, where they're going to be the great sacrifice of the shedding of animals' blood as a substitute for Israel's sins for that past year. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us the blood of animals doesn't do anything. But what God is doing is he's pointing forward to what is going to be the great sacrifice that's going to take away all sins of all people for all time. And that comes in Jesus. Because Jesus then becomes the substitute who gives his life and sheds his blood for the entire sins of the entire world. Again, in Hebrews 9, we're told, but Christ came only once and for all time, just at the right time to take away all sin by sacrificing himself. John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus coming, says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, all rolled up into one, the sin of the world. And Paul describes this in another way in 2 Corinthians, where he says, God made the one who did not know sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, to take our sin upon himself, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. This is the great exchange where Jesus is sacrificed, takes our sin upon himself, takes the judgment of God against our sin for the entire world, uh, suffers the very wrath of God against that sin on the cross, abandoned by God, and he does as done for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, that we might have total forgiveness of all of our sins, and that we might be covered with his very righteousness. You see, God took the only path that could save us. He was not given options. There was no other way to get us out of the mess that we were in. And we say, well, God must have had a problem. No, we had a problem. (laughs) And God took the way that cost a lot in order to get us out. Because God became our substitute in Jesus. God took upon himself in Jesus our own sin and the sin of all the entire world. God was our substitute who was judged and condemned because of that sin. Instead of having it be done on us, God, in doing that, experienced the punishment that would have and should have fallen on you and me. And thus, God brought about forgiveness of all of our sins. As a matter of fact, forgiveness for the sins of the world. And it took the blood of God to do that in Jesus. That's why Paul says, be on guard for yourselves. He's talking to pastors here. And for all the flock to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, with his own life. If that's what it took to bring us back to God, then, folks, there is no other options for us. We cannot say, well, I don't like that way. I want to try this way. God will say, dead end. Doesn't work. I, though, have done it for you. And that's why Jesus himself says, uh, I am the way, not a way, but the way. I am the truth. Not a truth, but the truth. I am the life, not a life, but the life. And then he says, no one comes to the, can come to the Father except through me. Why? Because Jesus is the one who took away the sin of the world. No other religion can do that. 
And if Christianity leaves it out of, it, of itself, then it can't do it either. Only Jesus can do that. Here's how Paul put it then. But how can they call on him? We've got a lot of people out there who don't know about Jesus. They need to know. But Paul says, how can they call upon him to save them unless they believe in him? And how, they, how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So, faith comes from hearing the good news about Christ, about Jesus. The most loving thing that you and I can do for a person is to tell them Jesus is the only way. And when they say, how dare you? You say, because he loves you so much. You want to hear what he did for you? It's fantastic. He did it for me too. And I want you to know that. You know, there are going to be many people surprised on the last day when they stand before God and find out that their way didn't work. Their fig leaves, whatever they were, didn't work before them. Jesus says, indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. People will say, well, how come those people who believed in Jesus make it and we don't? And it'll be, well, you know, you could have had it too because it's for you. But you chose the opposite. You chose human solutions and not God's solution. But the beautiful thing about this, as we share the good news about Jesus with people, and it is fantastic news. As we share that, there will be those who will actually believe it. And what Jesus says will come true here. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. And they'll do it because they walk through the narrow door through faith. And that narrow door is Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. He is the only way. We know that's offensive to the world around us, but it is not a hateful thing. It is a loving thing. Help us to lovingly, kindly share with our friends that Jesus, the same Jesus who saved us from our sins, saves them as well. And, and, and that invite them to come to him. He will not cast them out and to believe his message, his gospel message, that gives them life. In his name we pray, amen. At this time in our worship, we will uh, have the offering. Again, you can uh, give not just here in the church, but you can give either online or through text or by sending it in or coming into the church and, and giving it at that time.
Almighty God, we praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to remain constant in the struggle of faith, empowered by the cross of Christ, filled with hope and confidence. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to pastors, teachers, missionaries, and others who hold office of service in your church, that by their work and example, faith may abound in your kingdom, increase into all the earth, Lord, in your mercy. Preserve our nation in justice and honor and grant health and favor to all who bear the offices of government in our land. Guard and protect also all who serve in the armed forces in our country. Give them faithful and successful success in their service and grant that their homecomings be joyful, Lord, in your mercy. Grant healing, faith, and comfort to all who are in sorrow, who in need, in sickness or adversity. Especially, Lord God, we pray for Tig and for Karen, for Todd, for Susan, for Rosalie, for uh, Jason, for Jenny, for Mitch and Bill and Patricia, Bev, Kathy, as well as all those who are battling cancer. Uh, we pray also for those who have lost loved ones and who are grieving. We pray for uh, the family of uh, Charles Garricky, the pastor Charles Garricky, who uh, is going to be um, having the funeral this Wednesday at 10 a.m. We ask you to continue to be with them as they uh, uh, grieve their loss, but know that Jesus is Charles' Savior and has forgiven him and loved him with an everlasting love. We pray that exact same thing for the family of Roger, who is the uncle of Steve and G Jail Gipp, as Roger went home to be with the Lord, and also for the family of Ron, who is the brother of Sharon Hertzberg, as Ron went home to be with the Lord, that these families also may know that in Jesus Christ, their loved one now stands before you in the joys of eternity, all because that you supplied them with the forgiveness of sins that comes through their Savior and His shed blood. Lord God, uh, we ask that you be with all those who suffer persecution for faith, their faith, sustain and bless all who care for those who suffer, Lord, in your mercy. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And hear us as we pray the Lord that the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We do have some announcements here. Matter of fact, a whole page of announcements. Uh, we're hosting a neighborhood block party, as you probably well know. Uh, we're partnering with Pheasant Run Homeowners Association to do this neighborhood party uh, on Sunday, September 11th. It's going to be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the green space that's immediately west of Divine Shepherd uh, near the Pheasant Run signs. You can join us for some food along with a bounce, bounce houses, plural bounce houses, bingo, I'm not going to go in one, Bingo with prizes and games for kids and more. Uh, this is an outreach. Uh, is also an opportunity to connect with our community around us. They might, might learn more about Jesus from us and what he has done. So please come and even think about inviting your neighbors as well. To allow everyone to attend, there's not going to be a 1045 a.m. service on that day. Uh, we need help still with this event, uh, running the bingo games, uh, the face painting, that's another thing I'm not going to be doing, but kids, you can do that, and adults, if you want to, you can do that too, but uh, now I'm not going to face paint myself. Serving food and cleaning up. You can visit the volunteer table in the atrium or visit the website, our website and look for the sign-up page to volunteer for a shift. 
Also, on Wednesday, our Wednesday night midweek connection program is about to start up again. So just mark your calendars for the 7th of September. That's a Wednesday, 6.15 to 7.30. And you can plan on joining us for fellowship and education. There will be a midweek meal at 5.15 that goes to 6.05 before midweek classes. And it's five bucks for adults. Kids under 10 get to eat free. And we also need a few more volunteers to help with the midweek program. So you can also visit the table in the atrium to see the opportunities that are available. Uh, finally, as I mentioned in the prayer, Pastor Gierke's funeral uh, is going to be this Wednesday, uh, Oct uh, August 24th at 10 a.m. here at Divine Shepherd. Uh, visitation will be from uh, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the atrium, and then a luncheon will follow afterward in the gym. God's blessings to you uh, this day, and always remember, it's not arrogance that we say Jesus is the only way. We say it because we love people, because he truly is the only way by what he has done. Mm -hmm.